the same spiritual path, you know, to be together, it really is a tremendous benefit. Um, both, uh, most importantly, in, in your sadhana, and that you have someone actually there to go through things with, someone who can communicate effectively, um, who is not going to project, and point the finger type of thing. And so if you're in a conscious relationship and both of you are committed to that, to being conscious, and in this particular case inquiring, then there's much greater likelihood, probability that that relationship will pan out. In other words, it will work out, not where people are just tolerating each other 20 or 30 years from now, but are very deeply connected, recognizing the oneness of what is. And so that's just not a very common thing in this culture. And so it's really nice to see that when that occurs. And, uh, oftentimes when there are relationships and one person is committed to one belief system and you know, one person usually gets on the spiritual path and the other person doesn't and they end up arguing or fighting or there's family squabbles and you know, it's not just your parents and your brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts that try to pull you off the path, off the spiritual path and discourage you from doing all the, the weird things that people do when they, when they start actually getting into the spirituality and they start meditating and breaking away from the mainstream and traditional conditioning. So this is a, it's a, it's a very sacred, uh, it's a blessing that when you find someone who is actually in alignment with you on that same spiritual path, but not because you were told to be on that path mm -hmm. since you were little. You were not brainwashed or conditioned into that. You. You reasoned, you looked at the options that were available, you sampled life, whatever, and then there's a conscious decision to, you know, to go inward uh, based on that. Mm -hmm. so. And communication is probably the greatest obstacle to relationships staying together. Because most people's idea of communicating is not necessarily listening. It's more about, let me tell you about what's going on. Let me tell you how I see it and how you've got it all wrong. And <laughs> if you only knew what I, you know, if you only would listen to me, then everything would be great. And that's the opposite of what conscious communication really is. Mm -hmm. It's really just about listening. It's about hearing and being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes. When you are able to do that, you no longer are identifying with the individual sense of me. You're no longer identified with this body as being who you are. Because as soon as you are able to do that, as soon as you are able to listen, you see, if you'll notice the way that the organs even work, of the body, you see, your ears, when you hear, the energy is going inward. When you talk, the energy is going outward. So there's a projection of the world. So you're only talking when there is a duality. You're both very closely located. But one is going in, the other is going out. It's rare that someone is able to speak, you see, and be conscious at the same time. Not unless they practice them regularly, but it's not the mainstream in our culture. So, if you are effective 
in your listening if you were able to ask questions not with the intention of persuading or manipulating a situation through your questions and making it look like you're really curious but you're really leading, which is very common, but to actually ask questions where you really want to know, you really want to see what that other person is feeling, what what's in the space, you're wanting to really find out what it is that they're they're wanting so that you can then from that place you can say, yes, I, this is what I would like in a relationship, this is the kind of communication I would enjoy. And then now both of you being aware of that information, knowing what they want and they know what you want. Now, if something does not fit within that, you see, then you recognize that, number one, they really don't care, either one, <laughs> or they just have become unconscious in that moment. And so if someone has become unconscious in that moment, then you can ask them, are you aware that in our last communication that um, we agreed on this, but that's not what's occurring, so I'm curious as to whether or not you were conscious of that. You're not going to blame them and say, I think you're intentionally trying to piss me off. You're going to say, do you realize we agreed? And, and since we did make an agreement, and that's not what's occurring, either, you know, you forgot, or you just don't care. Which one would you say it is? And in that moment, you're really going to find out whether or not someone really has the intention of having a clear space with you. In that clear space, when there's a clear space between you, you see, uh, this is indicative that your attention is turned backward. Because if your mind is projected outward on them and you're thinking and judging and assessing what they're doing, the mind is external. See, when the mind turns inward, it's felt as the self. And so this is why communication offers such a wonderful opportunity. In fact, if you master the art of communication, Master. That is self-realization. If you made that your spiritual practice, you just master the art of conscious communication, then the mind cannot survive, the externalized mind, the ego mind. depending on where you want to focus your attention. Because if you're listening, in other words, in order to listen and not speak over someone, you have to be behind the mind. Because the mind is going to be saying, oh, no, that's not, no, I don't agree. That's not true. You're, you could be, you know, they're wrong. I mean, I know what, I know what's true. They're not, they're wrong. I know a lot more than they do in, you know, chattering and going on. But if you stay behind the mind and you see all that going on and you don't react, then you're free. The tendency to react, this is the greatest, you see, tendency for most people in the world. They're constantly reacting to things. Someone cuts them off on the road, they scream, yell, cut them off, flip them the bird, try to get in front of them, do whatever they're going to do, right? Beat their horn. You know, drive by and give them the dirty look, <laughs> the disapproving look. I did a thumbs down. Thumbs down. There yeah. you go. Thumbs down. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, it's all an attempt to not be wrong. If they're wrong, I'm not wrong. See, all I have to do is make them wrong. I have to disapprove of them in some way. And in that moment, I'm better than that. I'm greater. I'm bigger. Better. Faster. Smarter. Stronger. Whatever it is, it's all a sense of I. It's mm -hmm. all the sense of me, and that's what grows it.
once you recognize that they are your mind, externalized. There are no exceptions. You say, well, you know, a lot of times people, you know, they're, they're you know, some people are my mind, but some people aren't. No, it's all your mind. The entire world of form is the externalized mind. Try it sometime. If you want to get angry, if you want to see if it's possible to get angry when you have your mind turned inward, when you're aware of self, try it once. Turn your attention inward, have your friend hold their hand up and say, okay, hit my hand. Punch, punch my hand. But, do it when your attention is back towards self. Can't do it. You cannot be aggressive when your attention is in the self. This is why the self-inquiry is so effective. It is the single one step that includes every spiritual path there is in one single thought, I. As soon as you give attention to I, you accomplish every single spiritual path, everything they teach, everything, all combined into one single thought, I. Because it causes the mind to immediately come back. That breaks the tendency or the pattern to do whatever it is that you think you're doing on the spiritual path. I don't care what religion it is, what spiritual path it is. It doesn't matter. Because as long as there's someone there doing it, whatever it is that you're doing, there's an ego. But if you feel the ego, in order to be aware of the ego, this is the important thing. If you become aware of me or I, that means there has to be an awareness that's aware of the I. Which means in order to be aware of I or the me, you must be in the awareness that's prior to it. Which is the first step toward abiding in that. Staying there. It's turning the mind and bringing it back in. And this is the beginning of spiritual practice. Spiritual practice. This is really the only spiritual practice that works other than surrender. Everything else is just a gesture, a pleasantry. Uh, that may sound arrogant, and that may say, well, you know, you have, you know, some pretty big balls making that statement. You learn the hard way. Once you've tried all these different spiritual paths and you've tried to meditate and you've tried yoga and you've tried all these different things and you realize that they don't turn the mind inward. The source of inner peace is not outward. And when you, when you really understand the way that the mind works, when you see the mind, when you're able to watch the mind, you're free of it. And the only way to be free of the mind, the only way to be behind the mind and watching the mind is to get behind the me thought. Because the me is the last thought on the way in. The me is the knot, the contraction that ties off the bundle, the bag. See, the mind is just a bundle of thoughts. So if you had this bag where you would hold the bag closed, see, that's the me, that's the not. Everything else that's going on inside of that bag, you know, the, the concepts and the belief systems and the ideas and the fantasies and the desires and all that, all that exists in the bag. And that bag didn't get full overnight. <laughs> See, that bag started out like a little teeny hole, 
little tiny hole, microscopic. Now imagine that you take a little teeny baggie and you push that baggie in, that's say the amniotic sac. Okay, it begins to take form. And as that little bag begins to grow, accumulate thoughts, that bag gets bigger and bigger. Your, your world, your accomplishments, what you are, what you gain, what you gather and accumulate begins to grow. Mm -hmm. And the awareness, which is everywhere, you see, now becomes more focused on things rather than on the awareness. So everything is being, the consciousness is being directed into, through the methyl. And then you have, eventually you get this huge bag of stuff. You see, you've accumulated this <laughs> massive sack. You can't do anything and enjoy it anymore because you've got so much baggage. You see? You're carrying such a load around in your mind that you can't see straight, you can't taste, you can't smell, your senses are numb, your life becomes relatively pointless because everything that you thought was going to give you happiness no longer does. And so you start saying, you know what, my bag's way too big. i got to start letting go of some of my baggage. <laughs> So you know what you do? You start turning your bag inward. You start to go back in through the hole. In other words, this is when the inquiry begins, when you start turning in, when you start pushing your bag back through that little hole. You see, you're withdrawing. And so sometimes while you're going back in, you start turning inward, you're going through the hole, and then sometimes you forget, and boom, you start filling your bag up again. And it's like an ongoing process. You're going in, you're going out. But gradually, you're unloading, you're bringing your baggage back through the hole with you. See, so with the inquiry, the I is pulling the mind back inward into the source, emptying the bag. So, the idea of thinking that you're going to be free of your baggage while you're still invested in things in the world, still trying to accomplish things in the world, still trying to be someone, it's, I mean, it's just is futile. There are people who participate in, in practices that believe you are going to be able to stay in the world and realize the self. They are polar opposite. It is not going to happen. There is no surrender through identification with form. The only thing that you're surrendering to when you identify with form is the thing that you're looking at. The things that you're giving attention to is what you're surrendering to. If you're giving attention to money, that's your God. If you're giving attention to women or men, that's your God. Bodies are your God. Your job, that's your job. That's your God. If that's, if that's what you're giving attention to. Now, if you turn your attention inward toward the I am, and you give attention to the formless awareness, all those things, all those things, are contained within it. So why not just give your attention to the I am, the awareness, which contains everything, and be done with it, so you don't have to pick and choose what you're going to give your attention to. You just give attention to that which contains everything. Then, you see your bag completely turns inside out. It dumps everything in your bag, pulls it right out the hole with you. And now you realize that you were the awareness that you were before you ever started to accumulate it. Mm -hmm. so, but that bag, you know, again, it's, it may get bigger and smaller. It may, it may start, it may, you may think it's gone. It's, it's completely gone. And then, it starts to accumulate again because you know you started on the spiritual path and you know your bag started to shrink and then all of a sudden the mind didn't like that you, you hit a pocket of vasana and all of a sudden you start to grow it again and it starts to grow and you know you were so close right you know <laughs> this is the mind's concept i was almost enlightened 
<laughs> you see, and then and then you start to grow your bag again. And all of a sudden, ten years later, five years later, you're more confused and more angry and irritated and nasty and feisty than you ever were. And you're frustrated and disappointed and disillusioned with your spiritual practice. And then you say, enough of this crap, I give up. Right? There is the beginning of the true sun. Until you realize that you don't know anything and that you have no control until that realization occurs, until you become so miserable that you don't want anything else anymore, the true spiritual practice has not begun. That's when it begins. Because there's still, once you, I mean, remember, your bag is still growing. Until you reach that point, your bag is growing. At that point, you begin unloading. You begin letting go of your baggage. You let it go through the hole. You let it get pulled out. It's like a person who's not going to get rid of their possessions in a boat that's sinking until... You see, until the boat's sinking, they're going to try to hold as much as they can. Oh, do I have to really get rid of that? Oh, I don't want to get rid of that. Oh, we're going to sink if you don't. Okay, I'll get rid of it. It's like, it's almost like you only let go of what you need to until you hit the point where you know that holding them, you see, <coughs> is creating the suffering. And so, just be conscious. The only thing that's necessary really is to be aware. You don't have to do anything else. Just be aware. By being aware that you're aware is the highest path. To be aware of awareness itself is meditating on the self. That is the only way to really move into that state. No matter how subtle the object is that you're meditating on, no matter how subtle the thought is, no matter how beautiful the emotion is, mm -hmm. it's still a thing, it's still a form, and there's still duality, which keeps the mind alive, it keeps your bag alive. Because sometimes the ego will even try to take love and mutate it into some type of earthly romantic attachment, you see. But in the name of spirituality, I'm going to devote myself to love, to this path of love. Love arises when the mind is still. That's when you feel love. If you're in a situation where your mind is still, then love blossoms. Then everything, you see everything is love. Everything is love. Everything is beautiful is peaceful. So if you get behind the mind and stay there, then it's possible to know what that is. Otherwise, the type of love, the brand of love that we're talking about in most cases is really a form of attachment. How do you know it's an attachment? Consider yourself for a moment without that person. Mm -hmm. If they left, or if they wanted to be with someone else, how would you feel? Okay, you want to know if it's love? Ask yourself that question. Mm -hmm. When you have more freedom, or as much freedom, in the relationship as you did when you were single, and there's love. Freedom and love are synonymous. Without freedom, there is no love. And since most people really have a difficult time with the L word, they really don't know how to define or assess that Usually the word freedom is the most 
effective word at establishing whether or not you're in a healthy, loving relationship. Not how many times they tell you they love you to reassure you. That's nice to hear. It is nice to hear. And, and I'm not, you know, putting that down. I'm saying you want to see if your relationship is happy. Do you have the same freedom as you would have if you were single? In fact, if you support each other and nurture each other, you'll actually have more freedom. Because when you're by yourself, sometimes there are certain things you can't get to. It would be really nice if there was someone, a good friend, someone who would support you and help you get things done when you're in a bind. Not all the time, but in situations. So there you can see where freedom actually, you see, actually grows you. It actually makes you more capable. See, if you're loving and you're caring and you're nurturing, then then you will have friends, you will have more loving relationships. That's why some people will say that their best, their greatest relationships, right, they're, they're, are with their friends. They're better with their friends than they are with their partner. Mm -hmm. Because there's no expectations on each other, no obligations. If you call your friend up and you say, hey, look, I got a date tonight, I can't get with you. Yeah, all right, cool. If you say that, <laughs> you say that to your partner or your spouse, your lover, they might get a little offended. Some of them, most of them. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that and you say, wow, see, and this is, after a while, you know, you, when you've been with somebody for long enough and you've worked out the, a lot of the kinks and, you know, you you kind of accept everything that they do. You know, the noises they make, the gestures, their shortcomings, whatever you call them uh, at the time. You, you come to accept them exactly the way they are. You don't try to change them anymore because you know it's futile. And you know all it does is lead to fighting. So you can either learn through being with someone for 30, 40, 50 years, or you can learn from being conscious just by being aware, by being sensitive to them. When you're not trying to change someone, you're basically, in that moment, you're recognizing that this is the way that God is expressing through that organism. It's perfect. Okay, yeah, that's, you know. Doesn't feel good necessarily. You may not like it, but it is what's so. It is what's going on. And so, hey. And when you're in a relationship and you you have that carefree attitude, not that you don't care. So, not trying to fix things. You're not trying to fix people. You're not trying to help them. Sometimes that arrogance can creep into a relationship. But they need my help. That's why I'm with them. Some people are gravitated toward people that that maybe are emotionally need. So, oh, they need me. If I if I just stick around and I just you know help them, then they'll change and they'll become everything that I want. That doesn't happen. They're not going to change to, be, to suit you. When you support them and you accept them exactly the way they are, it's a strange thing, but then they become exactly what you want. But you don't really care anymore. Because you used to want that. Now you don't care. You want them however they are. You want them to be exactly where they are because you want to be wanted what? The way you are. You want to be accepted. Now, of course, I'm talking about the personality and demeanor and behaviors and all this, and that's not the real you. I'm talking about moving into that place of acceptance so that the mind is no longer filling the bag. Once you no longer have preferences, see, your bag empties right away. The bag is just a bundle of preferences and beliefs and concepts. If you have no preferences, or if there's some kind of a tragedy that occurs, 
See? A tragedy changes, you see, the way you look at everything. Hmm. Things that were once important, when you're going through a tragedy, they're no longer important anymore. It puts things in perspective. Everything in your life could be, you could be worried about finances, you could be worried about everything, and then someone gets cancer. Now all of a sudden that doesn't matter. Right. None of that stuff matters anymore. It's like we'll worry about that. We'll deal about. We'll deal with that later. We'll worry about that later. It's no worrying, but it's going to be in the future now. Because <laughs> we're not going to totally let go of it because there's too much invested in the drama of that. So we're going to hold on to that. Put that in our pocket. And save that for no. Just if you knew, right? If you knew that this moment right now was your last. This is your last. This is your last. And you give attention to, you know what I'm saying? Look like you were dying. You've heard that. You've all heard that saying. The key is to let go of all your fears of dying. And those all exist in the mind. They're all in your bag because all your concepts and beliefs about death and life and how things should be and how they shouldn't be, they all exist in your big bag. Get hold of that eye and turn inward and empty your bag. Let go of all your concepts and then you're as empty as a child. Then your concepts, your, your belief system, your base of what you think is supposed to be the way it is, it no longer contaminates or pollutes your view. Your filter is completely clear, and you can see things the way they are, divine. I can say that every single belief and concept I ever had was completely wrong. In every way. I can't explain that. That yeah, has to be your direct experience. Some of you may have already discovered that. And it has to be wrong. Because every single one of those concepts or beliefs are what led you into the illusion. They're what made you buy into separation, divisions, other. If, you're, if your beliefs and concepts were right and true, the ego would never have developed. It wouldn't have been able to grow. What do you mean by right and true? Hmm? What do you mean by right and true? Right as in um, correct, as in uh, leading to the truth of your oneness with all that is. Okay. 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 Now, that being the only truth that there is. Okay. Um, and so anytime you buy into a belief or a thought, um, let's just say you're a kid and... Um, your parents say to you, oh, you're such a big boy. Oh, you're getting to be such a big girl. That's a lie. Number one, you're not a boy or a girl. You're the supreme being. Now you say, well, but it's all in fun. It's all in fun. You know, we're just, having, you know, we're just trying to make the kid feel good for growing. Mm -hmm. Fine. That's true. And so the child grows and it begins to identify and now says, oh, it's the body that's growing and that's me. Because they said, you are growing. You are such a big boy. You are such a big... Now not only are you big or getting bigger, but you're also a gender. There's two belief systems you've just adopted which mold, you see, the illusion of your reality. Sounds harmless. But they're lies. Are they conscious lies? No. Because if they were conscious, they would never say that to you. They're totally unconscious at the time they say that. And yet, because they feel, because that's what they were told, that's what their parents said to them, they pass on they pass in the baton. Everyone's passing the baton. But no one's really looking at it and saying, what the heck's in this baton? 
Yeah, it could be uranium, for all you know. I mean, but you're <laughs> passing the, you're passing the, you're passing the baton. You're giving it to someone else, and you're believing that you are, you're helping them. See, if you leave them alone, if you let them go, if you let them have privacy, and you don't bother the children or fill their minds with limitations,